So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what my research is all about, uh, data-driven healthcare. But first, I want to just uh, talk about this data explosion. So you've probably all heard about big data. Big data, big data, big data. It's all over the news. Uh, it's all over research. Because it, it's true. There's an explosion, a data explosion that's happening in every field. Um, so fields like finance, fields like medicine, fields like biology, in education. So I don't know, how many of you have taken a MOOC? Um, yeah, so there's a ton of data from um, just those courses online, from sports. Um, that The sports analytics is sort of blowing up right now. So we have um, what my group focuses on is machine learning and data mining. What this means is that we focus on the development of tools and methods to help us transform all of these data into actual knowledge. We want to use these data in such a way that we can improve outcomes, um, say in healthcare, or um, better educate um, students, or win more basketball games. So I'm going to talk about just two quick examples um, from my research, and we'll focus on the medicine aspect or healthcare aspect, and I'll give you a few examples of sports. So in recent years, our capacity to collect clinically relevant data has rapidly grown with our ability to, um, with more sensors, ability to store more data, and that's typically where our work starts with real medical data sets. And then working with physicians um, in a hospital setting, we identify a problem for which the data are relevant. And then building on techniques in machine learning and data mining, we develop the technology needed to help solve the problem with the ultimate goal of changing clinical practice and improving healthcare. So one problem in which we've been able to make considerable progress um, is in using patient data to predict avoidable bad outcomes. So an avoidable bad outcome, an example, um, are healthcare-associated infections. So you may have heard of MRSA or BRE, so these superbugs that live in hospitals. And this is when a patient gets admitted to a hospital for a completely different reason, and then they end up getting an infection um, during their hospital stay. And Kevin, you alluded to these infections in hospitals um, from different medical or healthcare um, procedures. And they're one of the top 10 contributors of death in the US. And it's estimated that one in every 20 patients admitted to a hospital will acquire one of these infections. So our work, one of our research projects um, that I worked on for my PhD, well, it's actually building a model um, based on patient data to predict each day a patient's risk of acquiring one of these infections. So here I'm showing you a screenshot of an actual medical record. So each row here corresponds to a patient, and the column here on the far right is that patient's probability of getting an infection um, for that day. So these are all automated, automatically calculated um, based on the patient's record. <laughs> All right, so moving on to sports analytics. So there's really been an explosion of sports analytics in terms of data. So stats have always been um, at, the, at the center of sports, but um, we've had, with new technology, we've been able to actually capture much more spatial-temporal data. So the player trajectories on the court or on the field um, across many different sports. Um, so the example I'm going to use here is basketball. So in basketball, um, the NBA has installed this system called SportView um, that's present in all 30 NBA arenas, and it's a system of six cameras that's continuously recording the game and tracking all of the players on the court um, at 25 frames per second. So we can get all of the X, Y coordinates of the players and the X, Y, and Z coordinate of the ball. What do we do with this data? So once we have all this um, spatial temporal data, we can answer really interesting questions to help um, teams strategize. So for example, uh, you might have a scenario where uh, a player releases a jump shot, and between the time when the jump shot's released and before it hits the rim or goes in, uh, players have a decision. So they can either go for the offensive rebound, so crash the board, or they can start getting back on D and prepare for the transition defense. So we answered this question um, using data from an entire season's worth of NBA games, and uh, we concluded that you should go for the offensive rebound. 
Another example uh, of using spatiotemporal data is being able to automatically um, identify uh, parts of a play or a possession. So for example here, I'm showing you an on-ball screen or a pick and roll. I um, mean, we can use the tracking data to automatically identify when all the pick and rolls happen um, during uh, a basketball game. So these are just a few examples of the type of research that um, I've had the, um, the privilege to be involved in during my PhD, and I'm hoping to continue these, um, these directions and projects um, at Michigan. So thank you.